the Superbike Show on Motorsport Radio. Uh, yes, uh, hello Steve, welcome to the show. You are live on Motorsport Radio and uh, thank you for being on at, uh, well, such short notice. Thank you, we, we dragged you on. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, so uh, Kiko Alexander-Giles, has, uh, he, he's responsible for, uh, for, for, for getting uh, um, Steve on at such short notice and uh, uh, Kiko, you've got questions. I have. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us again, and uh, great to hear you, of course. We're going to start off with a bit of World Superbike conversation. You've been commentating on it for a bit of this season. What are your thoughts on 2017? People would class it as a bit boring, but it's been a record-breaking year, especially if your name's Jonathan Ray. Um, yes, uh, it has. Um, yeah, I guess the, the trouble you're up against is uh, probably the other two races or events that people watch are British Superbikes and MotoGP, and they've been outstanding years as far as close racing is concerned. Um, and a, a kind of a real mixture of winners and, and people at, at the front of the pack. So uh, if, you, if you look at it and use that as a comparison, then World Superbikes probably hasn't had quite the same interest. It's a very difficult one. If you went back, I don't know, 10 or 15 years, maybe a bit longer, um, Mick Doohan was dominating it, and then after, after that, Valentino Rossi, I'm talking about MotoGP here. So yeah. people, things run through cycles, um, and at the moment, I guess you could probably say with World Superbikes, there's too many British riders in it, or too many British riders at the front. That's, that, I mean, if you chuck, if, if Marco Malavia had got his act together a bit earlier in the year and was uh, mixing it in as he was um, in his sort of uh, previous career before he retired and came back, uh, I think it would have sparked it up a bit. But, it's yeah, it's a difficult one. Uh, the Kawasaki is obviously very good. The Ducati is very good. The Yamaha and the Prilia are getting better. Well, we've just gone through a couple of years where there's been three or four guys that have been out in front, and um, it's it's left it, yeah, not quite as exciting as we'd have wanted it. But I don't think that will last for long. Do you think the amount of British riders in the championship is affecting not only the British audience but a worldwide audience? Because... If they have, if the other countries that are watching around the world haven't got a rider to cheer on, well, why would they want to tune in in the first place? Do you think it's having a, a knock-on effect across the world? Yeah, I think it probably does a little bit. Um, I mean, we've been through periods where there's been nothing but Spanish riders at the front, and we probably get a bit fed up with that. I think, um, yeah, uh, it, it's unfortunately you turn world superbikes on, and it could be turning British championships on, I guess, when you talk about the way Jonathan and Tom Sykes and Chaz, uh, mm -hmm. those guys are in there, and they seemingly have been for the last couple of years right up the sharp end. Um, so, yeah, we do need some other riders, but we need some faster motorbikes, and it's, it's a difficult one. I guess you're going to talk about the rule changes of what they're trying to do, and they're trying to penalise the fast bike. But that's uh, That's kind of happened, I guess, in lots of forms of racing over the years. People keep changing rules and regulations, trying to find a, a level playing field. But I'm not sure if you ever do. You you might try to, but generally the, the bigger, the fatter your checkbook is, the faster you're going to go. And you can buy the best riders, the best technicians, and have the good motorcycles. It's very difficult to stop that happening. Absolutely. Um, 2017, though, I think has improved a little bit because we've had Yamaha absolutely near the front, and Neil Camus been a lot more competitive on an MB Augusta. But people still think it is boring. Now, do you agree that it's boring or do you look for other dynamics to maybe focus on? <laughs> no, you'd be an idiot if you call it boring because watching guys of that talent and ability and riding motorcycles with 220 horsepower sliding around and things is, is not boring as far as I'm concerned. Watching Formula One is boring because nothing happens. But truthfully, the, the races uh, haven't at times been as exciting as we would have liked. And yeah, I guess you're going to have to say that Jonathan Ray's dominance really has, has sucked some of the fun out of it. But you can't st stop him from doing that. He's a hugely talented rider on one of the best bikes out there. So he's He's dominated the series uh, this year, but the Super Sport has been really good. Super Stocks has been really good. As far as the whole meeting's concerned, I think Superbike is really good. I quite like the Saturday-Sunday event. It gives you two days to kind of suck up the atmosphere and what's going on. Um, <laughs> and, and yeah, I, I, I certainly wouldn't call it boring. But, yes, there has been a certain amount of dominance there, possibly certainly the first part of the year from Kawasaki. Um, and it's nice now, as you just said, to see the Yamaha getting faster, and I think the Aprilia is ready to turn the corner as well. 
Absolutely. Are there any advantages that World Superbikes has over MotoGP? You alluded to the comparison between the two early, with MotoGP having loads of different winners at the moment. But what has World Superbikes got that maybe MotoGP hasn't? Is there, a, is there something that makes World Superbikes maybe in one way a little bit better than MotoGP? Well, I guess from a manufacturer's point of view, um, if I'm Mr. Honda, Suzuki, Kawasaki, whatever, um, I would like you know, they're showing their wares a lot more. Um, there's no doubt that the manufacturers in MotoGP it's the premier class and they want to be in it, of course, as does F1 and Mercedes and Renault and people like that making engines. <coughs> um, but Superbikes has two races over a weekend, which is good. Um, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, as we all know. Um, it is in, in ostensibly production bikes. I know they're modified quite heavily, but you can actually see that there's a ZX10 out there and you can see there's a Ducati Panigale and you can see that um, there's R1 Yamahas out there and Fireblade. So you have got that direct relationship with what people are going to purchase on the roads. Um, and I guess you could say that the mixture of all the other classes that are out there, uh, there's only three in MotoGP, isn't it? We might have... Motor 3, Motor 2, Motor GP, whereas there's a lot more classes in World Superbikes in, in that um, they, they just have more races going on over the weekend. So it's a pretty packed weekend, I guess you'd say. It? And the organisers, Dawn, we know are the same organisers, but they're doing a real big push on giving paddock entertainment in World Superbikes with paddock shows and everything else that goes on. So it's a pretty full day. Do you think that with the, with the split of, um, of races over the course of two days, some people will say, oh, I can't afford to do for, go for two days. But if they do in a, a World Super Sport race on the Saturday as well as on the Sunday, do you think that may be a more appealing option for, a, for the paying audience, trackside? Um, I, I don't know, because I haven't been a paying audience for a long time. All I can say is Sunday, you still get, a, even if you just go on a Sunday, you get a full day with Super Sport, Super Stock. Um, you've got the the little 300s out there and you've got one superbike race. So it's not as if you're losing out on anything. It's still a very full day of racing goes on on Sunday. If you've got a weekend, then great. Turn up on the Saturday, watch qualifying super poles and, and you get to see a race going on as well. So I think that's probably a bit of a bonus. And and I guess superbike, unfortunately for superbike, they've had some of the wind taken out of their sails when, when it went from two strokes to four strokes in MotoGP. Superbike yes. was there been there a long, long time, 1988. I remember being at the first race at Donington Park, which was the four-stroke. Back then, it was all two-strokes. So there was a big difference. There was a massive differential between the two classes. Well, in lots of ways, MotoGP has sucked up some of super bikes because the bikes aren't dissimilar in the fact that they're four cylinders, 1,000 cc's, four-strokes, yeah. um, with, with a kind of a, you know, a similar type of package out there. Okay, one is... Um, it hasn't got the same restrictions, and they are the ultimate machine in MotoGP. So, yeah, they've, they've actually kind of, in some hows, evolved to a much closer championship, the two of them. OK, that's an interesting point. Uh, moving on, then, um, I'll give you a scenario here. In, uh, at Aragon, on day three, which is the Sunday, there was 11,234 people trackside. At Jerez, on race day, which is Sunday, um, there was 11,022 people trackside. So with them figures in mind, the Spanish rounds are the lowest attended cha um, championship rounds across the whole season so far. We haven't taken up to Qatar yet. Um, but mm. it's owned by a Spanish organisation, which is Dorna. So mm. but if, well, with both of them being the lowest attended rounds, why is that? What, what, what's going wrong for World Superbikes in getting people trackside? Um, well, Spain has always been very orientated towards MotoGP. It's got yeah. their superstars in it, uh, all their top riders, and, and, you know, it's kind of, I guess, dominated in some ways. If you, I haven't got the figures in front of me. If you took all the classes, I suspect that Spain is the, the, the biggest nationality in MotoGP, and it's, it's always really been that way. Um, but I can remember, again, if you went back a few years, back in the UK, I think World Superbike's got more than, than MotoGP. Um, I don't know. You can't force people to go. I guess when they've, had, when they've got, the trouble with Spain is, how many has it got? Four MotoGP races. It's got Jerez. It's got Aragon, uh, Valencia, and Catalonia. So there's four rounds in Spain anyway. Um, and I guess people can only go to so many races. And, it, and if you want to go to the top end and see your... Uh, 
your big heroes like Danny Pedroza and Mark Marquez and Valentino Rossi, that's the one you're going to have to go to. And, you know, let's face it, <laughs> World Superbikes, no matter how you uh, want to um, sugarcoat it, it's still Division 2, MotoGP's Division 1. Absolutely. Um, OK, so just sticking with that point, if you took a Spanish Grand Prix off MotoGP, would that benefit the World Superbike attendance track side or do you think it would stay the same? No, I don't think it would. I don't think the Spanish have ever truthfully embraced World Superbikes. Um, I, I don't really know why. I guess that um, the fact that they they sort of evolved with the two strokes and Spain used to make but ball tacos and bits and pieces and have, have had manufacturers out there that have made machines that have been in MotoGP. Um, no, I just don't think that the Spanish probably have embraced World Superbikes. That's it, but it... it it isn't the case in a lot of other countries. We certainly had a, a big crowd. Uh, unfortunately, the weather wasn't very good in Magnacourt in France and places like that. And um, I think we will get a big crowd if it gets back to Donington Park and places like that in the UK. Yeah, just while you're on the Donington Park, uh, I think in 1999, the figures for them for the Grand Prix was 15,000, 15,000. And then for, uh, for the World Superbikes, there was 90,000 people that turned out to watch World Superbikes there. So do you think that it could change in the future and we will get the masses of fans going back to, to watch World Superbikes like it was in its golden... Uh, in, like yeah, the that's a, well, as I say, things evolve and, and uh, I guess if Valentino Rossi retires from MotoGP and another couple of seasons in World Superbikes, that could certainly boost the numbers. I'm not saying he's going to, but who no. knows? N uh, stranger things have happened. Um, and... Yeah, I, as I say, you just never really know. Things turn around and evolve a great deal. We're still waiting to find out where MotoGP is going to end up in this country as well, which is another interesting discussion. Um, but never say never. I just think that the fact of the matter is, no matter what you say, MotoGP is the premier class. Um, and if you looked at it in the car world, and I'm not trying to put any real comparison there, Formula One mm. probably gets 10 times, 20 times more than any other form of car racing. If you look at things like GTs and Formula 3s and Formula Electrics or whatever. No one goes and watches it at all. So it's only really Formula 1 where people go and watch it. Whereas we do have um, classes where still lots of people go. I would say, I'm not a circuit owner, but I would say that British Superbikes is the biggest earner for all the British circuits in this country. It's the top event and it gets the biggest crowds for anything. I absolutely agree. At Donington Park, again, we'll use the Donington Park example. There was more people at BSB than what there was at World Superbikes. Um, but moving away from the crowd then, obviously yesterday the, the World Superbike rule changes came out at long last. What do you make of them for next season? Well, um, there's a, an element of ambiguity in it in that they haven't really they said there's going to be some limits, but I don't think they've actually specified exactly what they're going to be and when they're going to be because I think it changes and it can... Uh, it, it, the Scott Smart and the team around him are going to kind of look at things and I guess start imposing the odd penalties, whether that's revs or, or whatever. And that happens in, in certainly in touring car racing. I know in British touring cars that they have weight penalties and all sorts of things going on. It's tough. Um, and if I was Kawasaki and Ducati, I wouldn't be very pleased because they are putting more effort in. It's a bit like uh, probably not many of the listeners out there would play golf, but I do play a bit of golf. And basically, it's like saying an 18 handicapper can play with a two handicapper because you get more shots given to you. So it evens it out. It makes a good game of it. Uh, that's never really been the case in motorcycle racing over the years, but maybe that's going to have to happen. Maybe we need to do things to make a show out of it. And it is a show. It's competing against lots of other events that take place uh, week in, week out, whether you're in Spain, Italy, France, Germany or wherever. Um, motor racing and motorcycle racing has to compete with other exciting things that take place. So maybe you have to make a show out of it. I don't know. I, it's a real difficult one. I, I personally don't like penalties, but uh, if if people don't turn up and watch it and it's the demise of superbikes, you have to change things. Is there a risk that World Super, uh, that Kawasaki could drop out of World Superbikes? That World Superbikes could lose Kawasaki as a manufacturer because they're not in Grand Prix? It's not impossible again. My concern has always been with motorcycle racing when you're in top level is when you start taking away certain technical uh, elements of it, 
the manufacturers will eventually disappear because most motorcycle racing over the years has been to develop better road bikes. That's one of the things that does happen. There is a direct correlation between racing and road and, and road bike. People sometimes forget that the, the Japanese manufacturers and Ducati and the Europeans for that matter, they don't go motorcycle racing because they love motorcycle racing. Truthfully, their budgets come from selling the bike. So you're not careful. It's a tail wagging the dog. And if you take away all the electronics, maybe, from Kawasaki in World Superbikes, they're going to say, well, hang on a minute, we budget. We use our research and development budget to go out and race and produce better electronics and better engines and better lubricants, the same with the oil companies and everything else. It's a test bed, and so that's what you have to be careful, that you don't go and upset people. So they say they pick up the toys and go home with them, because if it's not a test bed and they're not developing it, then why should they bother chucking millions of dollars into it? Good point. Uh, got a question here from Sarah Chambers. She wants to know, will these World Superbike rules stop Jonathan Ray from winning? I doubt it very much because I would suspect that Kawasaki uh, will be working as soon as these rules are stamped and approved and they know exactly what they are. Um, and it looks like there's going to be a rev limit, okay? Well, they'll go back and they'll redesign their engine probably that gives mm. them torque and the revs lower down um I, I doubt it frankly because i think they've got a great package a great team great rider um and i think they'll probably be able to adapt their bike as well as anyone else out there so i don't think it will stop him winning no unless i take a plug lead off i can't think what will stop him <laughs> it's true and another question here from tim davies should world superbikes have gone further with the rule changes hmm well <coughs> it's a difficult one because until you get the first race underway um, how do you know what it's going to do? That, that's the deal with racing. You kind of keep your powder dry until you get out there and race the first round. Um, and sometimes there's a bit of sandbagging goes on. Um, no, I don't, think, I don't think it needs to change that dramatically. What I'd like to see is the other manufacturers putting more effort into it, and I'm talking about Yamaha and Aprilia, um, uh, to get out there and, uh, and possibly improve to, to bridge the gap. I'd rather see them getting better than bringing the top ones down. That's personally what I'd like to see. But again, you can't force manufacturers to go and spend lots and lots of dollars on their super bikes if they're already budgeting and spending it in MotoGP. So they're stretching themselves all the time. Absolutely. Um, if you was a race organiser or director, what would you do to make the racing a lot closer? Um, I, I do think that I would possibly, uh, I'm not saying it brings it closer, but I think I would, in World Superbikes, I'd have a pace car. Um, again, not a big fan of them, but it works in British Superbikes. It stops races being stopped when it's televised. It keeps the action going. And on occasions, it closes the pack back up again. I think that's one thing that they probably should look at. It works very well in British Superbikes. I can't think why it wouldn't in World Superbikes. Um, other than that, I guess what you have to try and do is do a bit of a Bernie Eccleston, and that's be the ringmaster and try and make sure that you, you swap riders around onto bikes around that somehow will make it a more even match, which might mean trying to get budgets for a lesser team that uh, can afford a better rider. That's probably another way of trying to sort things out. You have a look at what the packages are. Uh, and really try and match it all up to make sure that you've got some close racing. But very, very difficult, as I say, until we get the first and second races maybe underway next year. Who's going to know what's, what package is going to work and what doesn't? Absolutely. Um, back to you, though, as a, as a person, as a commentator, presenter, da 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 What will your plans consist of in 2018? You're the voice of the North West 200. Is that in your, in your diary? Um, yeah, I've, uh, it's, a, it's a long way in advance. I suspect that yeah. um, for 2018, I'll certainly be doing Northwest 200 TT, <laughs> Classic TT, maybe some World Superbikes, but I'll be racing myself in some classic races. I'm booked to go out to New Zealand and Australia in March doing that. Uh, I'll probably be doing 10 of my theatre shows, The Mad Tour, um, and lots of uh, after dinner talking, hosting different events, uh, I pretty much most weekends I'm busy doing something. Okay, talk to us a bit more about the Mad Tour. So, for people that are unfamiliar about it, what is it and what can they expect to find there? All right, the Mad Tour uh, was conceived four years ago. Uh, it's called the Mad Tour because my daughter hosts it and it stands for my adolescent dad, M A D. <laughs> 
Um, and um, she has had to endure my childish behaviour for, I, I better not say how old she is, but 20 plus years. Um, and it's really stories about what used to happen when you could do daft things, when PC stood for pulling crumpet as opposed to politically correct nowadays. Um, and, and it's back, back in the 70s and 80s when we used to go racing at weekends and muck around the rest of the time, whereas now everyone goes to see the physio or the, goes to the gym or see the dietitian or whatever they do. Um, and it's a seven-day-a-week a job where ours was Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and we had the rest of the time to muck around. So, yeah, it's, it's probably what I call the halcyon periods, dangerous periods, don't get it wrong, but uh, it was times when we all travelled around, known as the Continental Circus, having a lot of fun and enjoying ourselves. So, really, it's, it's going back in time, really. Could be called the good old days, even, but it's uh, it's a you know fun evening guaranteed two hour show at theatres around the country. We'll be coming your way sometime. Ah, oh, that's good. That's good. That some does someone that mucking about involve something in Macau about a uh, was it? A, oh yeah, there's there was lots of mucking about Macau. Def definitely falls into that category. So yeah. does being a doctor on a plane. So does blowing up toilets. So there's just things that used <laughs> to happen. Trouble followed me around a little bit, I'm afraid. Oh, I'm sure it does follow you around. Uh, we've got a quick question here from Tony Scott, who uh, did run the Moto2 outfit in British Super Sport. How do you feel about Moto2s being introduced to British Super Sport within BSB? Do you think that's a good idea? Um, I guess it's down to cost really um <clears throat> yeah it seems as though super sport is disappearing i'm not really too sure why because it's always been some great great racing i guess it's down to manufacturers not making that class of bike now um uh, someone made a suggestion the other day a friend of mine about what about, what about having 750s because maybe that's a category that we could find enough bikes to get involved with in the 750 class all, all i can say is I think as long as we've got competitive bikes out there and, and riders that can um, ride them to the maximum, then it doesn't really matter what CC they are. Uh, I'm just a bit worried that Moto 2 would be way out of the budget of some people. Certainly, it'd be a higher budget to start again than Super Sport is at the moment. So whether or not you can find enough teams that have got the budgets to do that, I have no idea. The other thing that we didn't mention is I wish, to God, for God's sake, we could have some sort of uniform class with the world really so we could have more wild cards because that is something that we used to love seeing when uh, we went to different countries particularly the amas in america and certainly british super bikes over here in german super bikes and went to germany so it'd be nice to have at least five or six wild cards at each round yeah because that was again a unique selling point for world super bikes that you could that world super bikes would rock up at brands Hatch and shane byrne could go and win a race as a wild card and likewise for people like James Hayden and John Reynolds. It was a really big event and it was it was kind of like a weekend um, event where lots and lots of people gathered to watch like their heroes. At one point, Brands Hatch World Two Bikes was the biggest sporting event in the whole country. So do you think... Mm, yeah. Do you think, do you think well, that yeah, that's... I think that's a, you know I think but what would, to do that we have to get some sort of uh, uniformity with yeah. with regulations because at the moment British Superbikes is way away from World Superbikes so the bikes that we've got here wouldn't fit into World Superbikes and uh, I guess the IDM in Germany probably doesn't and certainly <clears> the uh, um, AMA which is not called AMA now in America what's it called um, Motor America. Uh, Moto America, I think they run pretty much standard bikes. It'd be cool if we could get some sort of complete uniformity of superbike racing throughout the world. That would that make life a lot easier. Yeah, that really would. Finally, on my list of questions, we'll just check the comments shortly. What is your autobiography about? Because when I gave you uh, a present at Stetson, we'll talk about that again after, actually. Um, what's your autobiography about, and is it coming out soon? Is it, is it on the horizon? Um, it's due to be out in May. Um, that, I haven't got a date at all, but sometime in May next year, it's due to be out. Uh, we're still working on a name for it, but it's pretty much the same thing. It's not a great deal about racing. It's about, it's about the things that go went on in between the racing throughout my life of 43 years without a proper job. So it's, um, <laughs> it's very much about the life and times of what went on back in the good old days that I said about earlier. So in some ways, it's a bit weird, really, because often books end up in the theatre. Well, where my theatre show is going to end up in a book. But obviously, there's a great deal more in the book. It's something like 80,000 words. So it's, a, it's going to be a proper proper read. Um, it's out in May, and I'll probably be in prison in June. 
<laughs> we look forward to seeing you there. Wandsworth, I guess. Um, when uh, I saw you at Snetterton, how is your remote control mouse going along? Just explain to people about the, the remote control mouse for those of them who oh, don't. I'm going really well. I actually ended up in Burnham on Sea at one of our theatre shows last weekend. Scared uh -huh. the shit out of my daughter. Uh, <laughs> it, it, went, it went on tour, and then she was coming out onto the stage to introduce the show. It came flying out from behind and frightened the life out of it. So it's going really well. It's definitely going to end up at the NEC Motorcycle Show. It'll be on the stage there. It's oh, usually got a little sign pinned on it with, for James Whitham, who will be working alongside me at Motorcycle Live on the Black Horse stage. And often he starts rabbiting and we can't get him off the stage, so it's often it goes out with a sign, up, sign <laughs> on it. So I shut up and come off the stage. <laughs> Have you got a name for the mouse? No, I haven't yet, because I've got actually... It was very kind of you to donate me uh, the mouse that you did, but I've got about three of them in different ranging sizes. Oh, I yeah. actually call them rats, but you're probably not supposed to do that because people in the Isle of Man don't like rats. <laughs> I suppose that's a, that's a point. And the last bit, then, we're going to come to it. This is the last question. Um, should is, is World Superbikes decline, I suppose you could use that word, decline? Um, is that down to um, World well, so Superbikes being behind a paywall and not on the BBC or ITV or any other free-to-air broadcast? Um, well, actually, Superbikes hasn't been on a free-to-air, and I'm uh, going to get this right, um, I think since 2001. Uh, because with, that was, with yourself that, and Lee Diffie? Uh, yep, that's right. Yep. And then one year with Charlie Cox. Um, yes. So it hasn't been on <laughs> free-to-air for some many, many years. Um, so, yes. But that doesn't help, of course, because there was a period of time when it was hugely popular back in the foggy era um, when it was on free-to-air. So, yeah, that certainly hasn't helped it, um, you'd have to say. Um, and that's probably the same with, arguably, the decline of MotoGP. Now, I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek. Certainly, it's not going down to some great racing, but not anything like as many people are watching it. That's the problem. For the, for the, for the bike fan that watches MotoGP, he's going to end up on Monday morning at work and no one else has seen it, if you know what I mean, because it has, it's not on free-to-air telly. So, unfortunately, it's, got, it's lost about 80% of its audience now. So that's, um, you know, a shame for our lovely sport. And do you think Dorna, as World Superbike organisers, just briefly will look at that and think we need to really, really channel some money into MotoGP and into World Superbikes and into the broadcasters free to air to get them big audiences and the popularity back? Well, they haven't got to channel money into it. What they've got to do is take less. Um, what's okay. happened is, is the, that what what's really happened is that Dorna have um, been. They, the, when it when it came up for grabs and when it and I'm talking about all over the world, not just in the UK, um, they get paid probably three, maybe four times more by the pay channels than they do by the free to air channels, and they've opted to take the money from the free to air channel. Sorry, the pay channels, um, which clearly boosts the coffers at Dorna Towers. So, uh, and that's happened certainly in France and Italy and in the UK where they've lost the free to air factor and they've lost eighty percent of the TV audience. You've lost the casual viewers. That's really what is rather sad. And I'm not saying they, they're not necessarily big, big bike fans. They maybe don't own motorbikes, but they used to thoroughly enjoy watching it. And we've lost that. Absolutely. Steve Parrish, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for coming on. So no like problem whatsoever. Cheers now. Take care. Bye-bye. Ta-ra. Thank you. The Superbike Show on Motorsport Radio.